Hey, weirdos. I'm Elena. I'm Ash. And this is Morbid. Part two of Jack the Ripper. Yeah, part two of uh, a few parts, I'm, I'm going to say. Yeah, we did say that. <laughs> I think we told you it was going to be four. Maybe we said that, like, Yeah, I think I said it was probably going to be four. Probably going to be five. Might be five. But here's my thoughts. Okay. Uh, we gave <laughs> Albert Fish four parts. And this is Jack the Ripper. I feel like it deserves a little more. Yeah, well, and there's more victims involved, and there's, like, you had to set up London as the yeah, scene. This just... You had some really, like, cool asides. Yeah. Not cool, they were actually, like, horrifying, but, but interesting. interesting to hear about. You know, it's uh, this case, The ca- it's one of those cases where the character, no, not the character, where the setting is also, like, almost like a character in this in the story you exactly know? like that's this has a lot to it a lot of like the police force at the time a lot of like inner workings and what was going on with all that and like there's just so much going on and there was so much you know there was so many news reports about this the media plays a big role in it there mm-hmm. was the letters that we haven't even gotten to yet because they haven't even been sent yet the ripper letters right he hasn't even been named jack the ripper yet like this is there's so much that it's, it's a just... saga, and it, and it was when it, it was on, when it was ongoing. You know, yeah, it truly is. So we'll see if I can wrap it up in four. I will try to do so, but not at the expense of giving all the information. Never. That's how I feel. Okay. Um. So here we are. So when we last left you in part one, uh, Marianne Nichols or Polly, as she was known to those who loved her, was found brutally mutilated and killed. Yeah. Uh, at this point, too, the new head of the investigation of the criminal investigation department of the Metropolitan Police, um, Robert Anderson, has been told by a doctor that he needs to take, I said, two weeks off. I actually double checked. I was wrong. It was two months he was told to take off. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. He was told to take off two full months and go on holiday. Do not do work because you might die. You know, it's funny. <laughs> I was thinking when you originally said it, I was like, wow, two weeks is just going to like bring him his life back okay. yeah just here it is i was like where do they think he's going yeah no he's going for two months he told him you were and i guess i did read in a couple of sources that the doctor actually said after those two months i will happily write you another month on top of that like another note saying you need another month damn but it was not at a great time because this happened as soon as the murder started yeah so, and he had just got the job he had just taken the job. Ooh, that, that doesn't look so good. No, I mean, he was definitely doing a ton of other... He was, like, doing spy work and shit before this. So he was, like, that's why he came into it so overexhausted. But, he gives you know. uh He gives Capricorn energy. He does a little bit. So <laughs> you're, like, shut <laughs> the fuck up. I figured we would start part two by going into a, uh, another thing just so you can have background on what we're talking about. A lot of these places, in fact, almost all of these places that we are going to be talking about where victims were found or seen last um you're gonna hear spittle fields a lot um spittle was actually a name for a type of hospital spittle oh uh it was actually i think it was like a charitable hospital where like they did this for free they would take care of people who couldn't pay for medical care um so the fields east of the saint mary spittle it's called was uh which was founded in 1197 by the way oh my goodness yeah uh, were where the Spitalfields got their name. Okay. And so there's apparently this beautiful and like very imposing and just like gothic looking church called Christ Church that still stands there today and was here in that spot during the Ripper crimes. Like you could go to this spot and be like, this was here during all of that. Love it. Um, and it's or it's basically around that is Spitalfield Markets and other businesses. And a lot of Ripper locations are in Spitalfields. So Dorset Street, where where we've already mentioned that street, 
it's where a lot of the lodging homes were and where a lot of the women were killed that were killed by Jack the Ripper were on it or out and about on Dorset Street. Um, it was considered one of the worst streets at the time and very dangerous. But like um, what street wasn't in London yeah. considered one of the worst and very dangerous? It's true. Well, London itself had a whole other end that wasn't as dangerous. I should so say Whitechapel. Yeah, in like the, the Whitechapel area was definitely like just seedy, gnarly. Uh, but door, there were certain streets that were like, you turn down that. So those were the streets that the police wouldn't go down by themselves. Right, right. So that Dorset Street was one of those. Um, Annie Chapman, who we're going to talk about, um, is found murdered on Hanbury Street, which is also part of Spitalfields. Uh, Fashion Street is where Catherine Eddowes, we will talk about her in part three, where she was staying and also where we see Elizabeth Stride staying with a man for some time. We'll talk about her, too. Um they they were just everywhere. The Spitalfield is fields is a huge part of this story. The Ten Bells Pub still stands today and was possibly the last place Annie Chapman was seen. It's just crazy. Like you can literally right. go there and be like, "Whoa!" Like to this sit, is where to sit there it would be so heavy. It would just to think like this is the last place she was seen, right? Like alive with somebody. It's a lot. Um. So. I was excited when I was, you know, you see Spitalfields over and over again. I was excited to be able to bring Ghost into this. So I was waiting for you to, and I wasn't going to steal your thunder and make a comment because that's your band, baby. (laughs) But I was like, she's not saying anything about Spitalfields. Yeah, no, of course I am. Uh, It happened to fit perfectly that there is a song on their latest album, one of which I love. This is one of my favorite songs on the album. Can confirm. Called Respite on the Spitalfields. And I had to look into this because, of course, what could that mean? And when you listen to the lyrics, you're like, all right, what's this about? Um, Apparently, Tobias has said it's about the aftermath of Jack the Ripper. And it's very obvious when you know that. Mm -hmm. Um, He said it's all based on the fear that prevailed because of the fact that he was not identified. Uh, He said in an interview, you know, the fact that he was never identified, it says, which meant that even though he had technically stopped killing at some point, they were never sure that he was not going to do it again. So for a long time after, there must have been fear, especially among women, that it could happen again, because you don't know where he is. You don't know where he's hiding. You don't know what happened. Right. So we'll get into the aftermath of the Ripper murders and probably part four or five, four or five, whichever one we end on. Uh, When we talk about theories and suspects, we're going to talk about how the aftermath was. But the song has lyrics like, you know, he sliced and diced our dreams to to pieces. And the moon in the gutter has a story to tell. One day he will come back from the bowels of hell. So creepy so heavy when you actually dive into this case and when you realize what it's about because i we listen to ghost like all the time in the car like when we take our little morning drives for coffee and i've heard this song a million times but then you were saying the other day you were like this is about jack the ripper and i listened closer and i was like holy shit yeah it's just it's the even the music yeah kind of brings you there it's like a really well done like homage to that time i think and then they say like they're leaving london yeah like like we're leaving the city like goodbye seven sisters which is like a road in london like there's it there's a lot of it i'd suggest you go listen to it especially since you're listening to this series right now it'll get you in the mood it definitely got me in the mood yeah it's a good song um i may come back to this song later in part three-ish maybe when we talk more about police and the shenanigans that arose around this case we're gonna we're gonna touch upon that in this one too um but there's a lyric that i also wondered maybe referring to sir charles warren who led the metro metropolitan police force during these crimes um but that was just kind of an interesting look into spitalfields and a good song related to it basically um but and i'll tell you the lyric that i think might be referencing him but it was like when I want to wait a little bit until we get there. It, will we get there today? Um, I don't know if we'll get there today. I should, you know what, I'll give you the lyric. Now, because say, why should make I make you? Wait. So there's a lyric that says, you know, uh, the king that we hailed was the Wizard of Oz. Like yep. we found out that the king we hailed. The thing about Sir Charles Warren, and I'm going to go into him right now, actually, so that it does kind of work out, is that he, everyone had such high hopes for him. Mm. And I think he probably could have done a little better, but I think he had a lot of bad uh, hands dealt to him for sure. But he didn't handle some big events very well. Okay. And so I think people were so ready for this guy to come in and organize this police force and get whip him into shape. 
And then it just fell apart. And mm. to me, it's like the king we hailed was the Wizard of Oz. Like he kind of was the Wizard of Oz where it was all smoke and mirrors and it behind the scenes, it was a mess. That makes sense. But I don't know. I don't know. Can can we ask Tobias at some point, maybe? That'd be this, so cool. Does, can I just ask him, like, what did that mean? Did that, that mean Sir Charles Warren? That's on manifesting. That is on manifesting. I want to be able to talk to him about this case so badly now. Maybe you'll get the opportunity someday. I hope so, man. Uh, Tobias, you hear that? Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> you're listening, right? Hello. So quick little sidetrack about Sir Charles Warren while we are on that. Uh, just so you know, because he's going to come up a lot in this, and I don't want you to be like, who's that guy? Like I said, he was appointed chief commissioner of police for the Metropolitan Police Force in March 1886. He was a major general in the Royal Engineers, and his militaristic ways were definitely something that made him a prime candidate for the job he was given. Uh, he was actually the third choice for this job, Ruh-roh. but, you know details third time is the charm they got him so he was there to put them all in their place essentially because the metropolitan police force was a fucking wreck like there was just no uh, there was a lot of disrespect there was a lot of distrust low morale amongst the ranks i mean a woman had walked past them like bleeding out with her intestines on the side and they didn't notice her yeah they just didn't know that about wraps that up so i guess sir charles warren came in he commanded respect he gave it back sometimes and he ran mm. a tight ship and he so wanted to, and he wanted to keep exactly so <laughs> i had to you had to so he kind of got the ranks in order he people knew what they were expected to do when he came in at least that was something that happened but unfortunately he also had a really rocky start and really finished to the role there oh. um bloody sunday november 13th 1887 was one thing that really just popped a a jagged hole in his tenure as commissioner, I would say. If something's going to do it, it is Bloody Sunday. Something called Bloody Anything is really going to do it. I'm not going to get into, like, the minute details here because we would be here for another episode on just Bloody Sunday if I did that. Maybe another time. Maybe another time. Uh, I'm just going to give you a quick overview so you know why people had a lot of distrust after this. Uh, Trafalgar Square, where uh, Marianne Nichols was arrested sleeping in, oh, okay, um, was actually a place where a lot of protests and gatherings happened often. And Warren was worried that, you know, the gathering of minds and ideas was going to threaten good society. He was worried that they were going to come together and they were going to just like riot and something bad was going to happen. So... He was like, I got to stop this. So he asked the Home Secretary, Henry, uh, Henry Matthews, to ban all gatherings in the square. So Henry Matthews took a while to actually like respond to this because, again, there's a lot of weird shit happening in this police force. There's a lot of like egos. There's a lot of like, I like this guy and now you're in his spot mm, and always. I'm not going to listen to you. Always. So he took a while to answer that. But after a couple of months, he agreed and he was like, sure, let's ban gatherings in the square. And when he did, Commissioner Warren announced this ban was going into effect. Several groups found this to be unfair and planned a large gathering to protest it in the square on November 13th. In preparation for this, Warren stationed 4,000 constables, 300 mounted policemen, 300 mounted lifeguards, armed foot guards, and more in the square. That's a lot. I'm sure... It probably comes to zero surprise to anybody listening right now that shit got violent and bloody very quickly. Of course. So needless to say, he was not beloved after this. No. Then with the Ripper murders, things were just getting worse. So if you know me, you know that I really do. I do love a good compliment. It feels good to get a compliment when you're just walking down the street singing, look at my Rothies, look at my Rothies, these are cute. Have you ever seen somebody wearing a colorful pair of flats and you thought, oh my god, those are so cute? Well, those were definitely Rothies in my opinion. Rothies are the perfect shoes for commuting and traveling because everyone notices them. They're known for their chic pointed toe flats, but honey, that is just the beginning. They have tons of iconic head turning designs there's bright but like still at the same time sophisticated colors and rothy's works with every single outfit wear them with yoga pants or dress them up for a night out they are completely comfortable like insanely comfortable i feel like i'm wearing slippers half the time as soon as you take your first step you think ah 
That really is more like it. And Rothy's takes sustainability to the next level. All of their products are knit with thread that's made from plastic water bottles. They've actually repurposed about 125 million water bottles so far. And it's just crazy to think that like these shoes are so cute and they're also kind of saving the planet at the same time. I also am just like amazed at how comfortable these are. If you wear flats, you know that like nine out of 10 times you're going to be a blister city. I never got a single blister when I had my Rothy's on the first time I wore them. Nope, never, never, not once. They're so comfortable. They're super cute. I seriously get complimented all the time. And one of the things I love most about them is that they're super durable because you can toss them in the washer. So if you step in a mud puddle or you spill something on your shoes, have no fear. Your new favorite shoes are waiting. Discover the versatile styles you can wear absolutely anywhere and get $20 off your first par- purchase at rothys.com slash that's R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash morbid for $20 off your first order. And I'll say at, at some point, I'm going to read you like an internal memo that he wrote about them that like, oh, I was like, Charles, He's, <laughs> you're not you're not killing it, bro. Yeah. So after the murder of Polly Nichols. It was Inspector Frederick George Aberlein and Inspector Edmund Reed who were really on the ground investigating this case to just the nth degree. Those names do sound familiar. I was going to say, probably more than Edmund Reed, I would say Inspector Aberlein is someone that everybody's... Yep, that's the one that I recognize. Yeah, I was going to say that's somebody that a lot of people like connect with this case with for good reason. Now, when Mary Ann Monk, who was Nichols's friend and the one who helped identify her, mm-hmm. uh, said to Aberlene, you know, she has a husband, estranged, but she has a husband. Yeah, he might know something. Aberlene immediately located him to bring him to the uh, the inquest. Get and it, Aberlene. It was in front of the inquest that they were like, hey, you need to bring this guy in. And Aberlene was like, can have him by Monday. And he had him by Monday. So he's on it. Yeah. So we're going to talk more about Aberlene later for sure. So this brings us to September 8th, 1888, the day after Robert Anderson, the new assistant commissioner of the CID, has taken a doctor ordered holiday to Switzerland. Oh, man. Yeah. On this morning, you are now going to meet John Davis. Hello, John. John Davis is a 56-year-old carman who worked for Leiden Hall Hall Market. I hope that's how you say it, or Leiden Hall. I'll say Leiden Hall. It sounds better. Leiden Hall does sound better. Yeah, he worked for Leiden Hall Market, living in a lodging home at 29 Hanbury Street in Spitalfields. He was living in the third floor attic with his wife and three sons. They had moved into this lodging home three weeks prior, and since living there, they had learned that often sex workers would haggle with and bring their clientele into to the yard outside of the building and he would often have to kind of like shoo them away (laughs) that was just like part of his daily routine what Um, an interesting time very interesting time the yard in the back of the home had a gate that was never locked it was just a gate and actually most sources i saw were like we don't even know if it did lock yikes so it was an easy area for people to just trample through or to bring clients to or to what was called sleep rough which was sleeping outside Okay. Um, and it was kind of like a through way that people would just use. So they roughing just it. stomp through this yard. Do people say roughing it? No. Roughing it? Yeah. yeah. Like if you're going camping, you're like roughing it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It used to be called sleep rough when you were sleeping outside. Yeah. Uh, this lodging home was one that you would typically find in this area in the East End. It had eight rooms and there were 17 people living in them. Holy so shit. very cramped quarters. You would say so. The previous evening, September 7th, he said he went to sleep around 8 p.m. and he woke up, quote, from 3 a.m. to 5 a.m. on Saturday and then fell asleep until a quarter to six when the clock at Spitalfields Church struck. I had a cup of tea and went downstairs to the backyard, end quote. In a coroner's inquest later, Davis said this. He said, quote, the house faces Hanbury Street with one window on the ground floor and a door at the side leading into a passage which runs through into the yard. There is a back door at the end of this passage opening into the yard. Neither of the doors was able to be locked, and I have never seen them locked. Anyone who knows where the latch of the front door is could open it and go along the passage into the backyard. There was a little recess on the left from the steps to the fence is about three feet. There are three stone steps unprotected leading from the door to the yard, which is at a lower level than that of the passage. Directly, I opened the door. I saw a woman lying down in the left-hand recess between the stone steps and the fence. She was on her back with her head 
with her head towards the house and her legs towards the woodshed. The clothes were much, much disarranged. I did not go into the yard, but left the house by the front door and called the attention of two men to the circumstances. They work at Mr. Bailey's, a pack case maker of Hanbury Street. I do not know their names, but I know them by sight. So he told the coroner that those men had got a police constable and that they had not entered the yard at all, nor had he again. They were like, we're not going in there. Yeah. The coroner was pissed. At one point, Davis was like, uh, I don't know what their names were. And the coroner was like, you don't know what their name, like no one talked to these men right. who came over there. And the, the, so then Davis was like, yeah, I don't know. I have to get to work. So I don't have, which is like, just, he didn't know. I like, was going to say. But the coroner said, quote, your work is of no consequence compared with this inquiry. So he was literally like, I, I don't have time for this. And honestly, the coroners, I don't blame them. They're probably getting so frustrated with these cases because they're like, no one's telling us anything. Well, nobody seems to be paying attention to anything. No. And as we'll see later, they're not giving them maps of the area. They're not giving them where the body was found sometimes when they're getting the body afterwards. They were really given shit all to work with. And then they're like, how do you expect us to do our yeah. job properly? And they're like, well, we need to speak to these men. And he's like, yeah, I don't know who those men are. Yeah, so, and it's like, dude, I know like that you don't know, but like, what the fuck? So these men ended up finding Inspector Joseph Chandler and they summoned him to the scene. Now, by this time, I should say anti-Semitism had made its way into this case already. Oh, no. And newspapers and assholes on the street were saying it had to be a Jewish person who committed these crimes. Why is the world so fucked up? Yeah, it was basically an excuse to attack Jewish people. Exactly. This was a purveying theme here. It goes through. When tragedy strikes, there's always people who use it as an excuse to execute their will wills of, you know, racism onto the masses mm -hmm. um, but it does become a thing where they're like well i saw her with a jewish man and it's like okay can you just like shut the fuck up yeah it does become a thing so it's important to note but what inspector chandler found was the savagely murdered body of a woman lying on her back her hands were raised um, and her face was so covered in blood as well as her hands that Davis said when he first saw her, he couldn't even tell where the injury was because it was just blood. Oh, whenever you hear that, too, yeah. you just it's so just to think about finding somebody yeah. in that state. Oh, I can't imagine. Uh, her legs bent with her knees facing out and her feet on the ground. Her coat and her skirt, both black, had been pulled up to expose her body and they were soaked in blood. She was wearing striped sock stockings, which were obvious from her positioning, and she had been completely and brutally disemboweled. Ooh. There was some kind of fabric or scarf or handkerchief, most likely, wrapped around her neck as well, but they said they believed that was done by her. Oh, like, okay. Like as like a fashion, fashion thing. Um, the police report said, quote, small intestines and flap of the abdomen lying on right side above right shoulder attached by a cord with the rest of the intestines inside the body. Two flaps of skin from the lower part of the abdomen lying in a large quantity of blood above the left shoulder. Throat cut deeply from left and back in jagged manner right around the throat. Her throat was cut so deeply and so brutally that the killer had almost removed her head from her body. Wow. And they said he likely meant to. He just didn't get to. He didn't have time. Because they said he literally grinded into that vertebrae in your neck. So he was trying to separate those bones for sure. At one point, someone in the crowd had gathered or someone in this crowd that had already gathered to gawk. Um, they grabbed a tarpaulin and they did put it on her. That was to nice. Cover her, which is nice. But like, don't do that. Oh, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> that's, that's really yeah, I'm sweet. like, that's nice. And you're like, that's sweeping evidence yeah, away. Yeah, that's not great. I understand the intention. I love it. I feel it. I'm right. there for it. But like logic, like don't do that. Right, right. So Chandler sent for a doctor to examine the body before moving it to the mortuary and began a search of the crime scene. He ended up finding blood stains on the fence about, um, and it was right above her, about 14 inches up. Damn. And some more on the wall behind her. Now, her wedding ring and what they think was two more brass rings were forcibly removed from her fingers and not found. Huh. Yeah. And they looked, they were like bruised, like he had like ripped them off her Jesus. fingers. Her pocket in her skirt was cut open with a blade and the contents were not stolen. They were just placed around her. There was a comb, some muslin fabric and a paper case that was just like open and empty were next to her on the ground. Um, next to her head was a piece of paper and a ripped up piece of envelope with the letter M on it. 
and postage from August 28th, 1888, with a couple of pills inside of it. Okay. In, in the envelope. Now, most intriguing, but something that really doesn't, it like plays into some suspects, but they kind of just let this go after a while. Most intriguing was a leather apron that was found nearby, soaked in water. Huh. Almost like it had been, like, rinsed off. Yeah, because there was a little water spout nearby, and they said it looked like it had been washed off. Which is weird, because you you leave leave her in the state that she's in, and, like, there's blood and skin and horrible things everywhere. But it's like, why would you wash off the apron? Yeah, and you could have, like, cleaned up the little contents that was in her bag. Like, you would think you maybe would do that. But then you, when you look at how quickly these are done, and what they are finding out that these are done so quickly... He didn't have time for anything. He had time to do his what he was there to do. He didn't have time for anything extra. Then why would he wash the apron? You well, would think that's that he why I don't think it belonged to him. Wasn't related. Yeah, just I don't think it to belonged be there. to him. It's intriguing. I don't think it belonged to him. Yeah. Leather aprons were everywhere. People were wearing them for a lot of different jobs. It it doesn't surprise me that one was in the yard. Yeah. Just discarded. Okay. Um, but And that's why I just don't think... He, yeah. he wasn't taking time to clean anything. No, because that never happened at any yeah. other crime scene, that, to my knowledge, right? Yeah, no, it's, it just doesn't, it doesn't really ring true to what he's doing here. To me, it seems like he's doing these things very quickly, very efficiently at most of them. And he's getting the hell out of there right. fast. And he must have somewhere he can go that he can clean up. Yeah, quickly. At his leisure, even. And then the other thing that's weird to me is that he stole her rings because previously, yeah. like, nothing had been stolen off of um, Polly. Well, and that's Polly the Nichols. thing. It doesn't feel like the motive here, like, they're brass rings. Like, it doesn't yeah. and it doesn't feel like the motive here is robbery or, like, for profit. Do, do you think that was a trophy? I don't know if that was a trophy or if it was to confuse police or what. Huh. But... I don't know. But this is Jack. That Everything else has the Jack emblem. Oh, yeah. This all, all has it. the Jack emblem all over it. So when Dr. George Baxter Phillips showed up, he stated she was indeed deceased and she was taken immediately away to avoid any further gathering of Good. people around her. Um, in the afternoon, a woman named Amelia Farmer came in and identified the victim as Annie Chapman, who also was called by some Dark Annie. She had been her friend. Later, her brother, and I, it, I've i seen it spelled fountain and also fountain, hmm. so I'm not exactly sure which one it is. I mostly saw it as fountain, so okay. I'm going to go with that, um, was brought into, he was brought in to identify her as well later, and it was something that destroyed him emotionally. Of course. Um, A family member should have never no. been brought in in the state that she was in. But they have to. I, no, I Next totally, kin, no, I know, but you know? I'm just like, oh my God. Yeah, it's like, like it's I mean, unfortunate. Like you should never have to go through that. No, you never should have to. And he started drinking as a result of seeing his sister that way. Um, And he actually suffered a breakdown. I'm not surprised. I mean, how do you ever get that image out of your head of your sister? Yeah. And apparently it got so bad. And this is um, from The Five, the book that I'm going to, um, I I think I linked it in the first part, but I'm going to link it again. Um, It got so bad that he ended up stealing from his employer at one point to buy alcohol and he got fired from his job. That's really He had a wife and two children. He eventually ran, like abandoned his family. Uh, the next week, he surrendered himself to the police station and wrote a letter to his wife saying, quote, Oh, my darling wife, it is the cursed drink. For God's sake, don't let the children touch it. Oh. And he felt supremely guilty that he didn't know Annie's troubles. In their last, they had a drink together the oh, last no. time he saw her. And I'm sure that was weighing on him as well. He eventually did regain himself. He got his family back and they all moved to America after That's this great. ordeal. So there was happiness. There was little. at least some kind of like he escaped with his family. Yeah. Now let's talk about Annie Chapman. She was actually born Eliza Ann Smith and she was raised in Paddington, West London and born on September uh, September 2nd, 1841. So another woman that died very close to her birthday. Yeah, it's. It, I know it's a strange little coincidence. Yeah, um, her mother was Ruth Chapman and her father was George Smith, and he was a military man. He served in the Second Life Guards. This meant that he was not deployed like overseas or anything, but instead worked as part of the Queen's household cavalry. He basically was in charge of keeping the Queen and the royal family safe at their home. Wow, which is a pretty important job. The, ma- uh, the family moved around a lot because of this military service, um, and the, the queen and the royal family would live in different places like Windsor and stuff, and he would have to go live there. 
That's so, kind of cool. But unfortunately, both the parents drank excessively and were known for this. Oh. They were actually not married when Annie was born and didn't get married until after she was born. And this was taboo so scandalous at the time they were seen as very taboo very scandalous um and annie soon was joined by a younger sister emily and another younger sister georgina Uh, i love that name it's really cute but this was much later when annie was like 15 years old wow and then they had miriam and a brother fountain okay now the family was doing well they lived in a lot of you know very nice homes and were not struggling with george's job being pretty upstanding and financially rewarding um during this time when they were living in windsor one of the many times they moved there uh annie got to know a man named john chapman oh now you're probably like hmm her mom's last name is chapman (laughs) oh that actually went completely over my (laughs) head so that's good her mom's last name is ruth chapman um they were related on their mother's si- on her mother's side, distantly like cousins of some sort. Okay, he was working in Windsor as a valet and making decent wages. Um, he would sneak Annie and himself into his employer's home, uh, you know, using the keys that he was trusted with, <laughs> and like not great. And they would drink his liquor together. That was like their thing. Okay, Annie got hooked on rum at this point. Oh, she no. really enjoyed rum. They liked each other. They, you know, keeping the bloodlines pure and all that, I Well, suppose. the thing is, you have your cousins and then your first <laughs> there cousins. It is. There it is. I had to. You got to bring it to a place of mean girls. I was waiting to. Um, and, you know, back then it just wasn't as uncommon as it is now. It was like way more common. <laughs> yeah. So Annie did not get along with her sisters. Uh, she was independent. She was rebellious. She didn't like the idea of being a proper lady. She didn't want to, like, conform to society. Huh. Her sisters, in contrast, were shy, what she considered prudish, and liked to stay within the bounds of what society had laid out for them. Because that's what they were being raised to do. They were just kind of going along with the family thing. Yeah. She was like, I'm not into it. She's also a Virgo, and I feel like I'm learning more lately that Virgos kind of like to push boundaries like a little bit. Not in a bad way, but like test limits. Yeah, I see that. My youngest is a Virgo, so yes, I agree with that. Mm-hmm. And then think of, we have some other family members and friends yeah. that are Virgos, and it's actually applicable to almost all of them. It really is. It makes a lot of sense. Now, after a ton of moves in 1862, the family was sent to live back in Windsor, where the Queen was spending a lot of time at this time. At the time of the move, they had been living in London, and Annie, being about 21 at the time, stayed behind to take on work as a domestic servant. This was very common. She was Honestly, she was, like, striking with brown, wavy hair, like, very piercing blue eyes. She had this, like, independent personality. She was feisty. She was unique. She just, like, wasn't going along with shit. Virgos are cool, man. Like, like, get it, Annie. Annie was cool. Not two years later, this is really sad, her father ended up killing himself by slashing his own throat. Oh, my. Apparently, he had retired from his job early and was working as what was referred to as a manservant depression took over he was not used to that kind of work he was used to a different kind of work he was predisposed to depression he was drinking a lot that mixed with you know the heavy drinking unfortunately he just couldn't get out of it okay um and if unfortunately too this meant that the family was not just losing him they were losing everything yeah they were financially ruined that's awful so ruth had to move all the kids back to london to stay with a friend in knightsbridge By this time, John Chapman and Annie were becoming very infatuated with each other, and he asked her to marry him. So they married May 1st, 1869. By 1870, they had their first child together, a daughter named Emily Ruth Jane, which is really cute that it's like Ruth after the mom. It is. Unfortunately, Annie liked to drink, and she had developed a taste for rum. Oh, no. And she had come from two parents who were very heavy drinkers. That's what she was shown. Mm -hmm. Um, She spent a lot of their money on this, causing them to have to move from their first home together back to a lodging, to lodging with her mother, Ruth, and the other siblings. Which is definitely going to be stressful. That's a lot of siblings. And she had a series of stillbirths before having another daughter, which is like devastating. Harrowing. Um, Another daughter named Annie Georgina Chapman. So George after her dad. Yeah, and she had a sister, Georgina, Yeah, too. and Georgina was and another one. she had a sister, Emily. So, yeah. interesting. So, it's cute. Uh, John got work on Bond Street and Mayfair, and they got a place in a pretty exclusive area, so things started going much more smoothly once he got this job. Are things just, like, ebbing and flowing constantly? Yeah, because then Annie got him fired. 
Oh, no. How? She stole something from his boss. Oh. Either stole clothing or something to pawn for rum, or she stole the liquor itself. Who can't tell? Oh. Uh, This made her brother and sisters furious. Uh, They were all religious. They all had upstanding jobs at the time. They were starting families of their own. They had grown up with parents who severely abused alcohol, and now they saw their older sister falling into it. They convinced her at the time because they were like, we're going to save you. (laughs) And I think they had like good intentions at the time. Um, They had taken a pledge. They wanted her to join the temperance movement with them. Okay. It persuaded alcoholics to take a pledge of abstinence from the drink. And they had all done so. So it's kind of like an AA. Temperance was pretty intense. It was a pretty intense movement. That's the sad thing because these like... Anybody struggling with alcoholism at this time didn't have a program that wasn't super that wasn't fucking intense. over the top and making them feel like they were committing, like, the worst thing they could ever do by even right. having a sip. Um, but they had, I believe they had good intentions here. They just wanted to save their sister from yeah. what they felt like their parents had fallen into. They were seeing her go down a bad path. And this is the resource that was available to them that's to do so. That's all they knew. And they were raised at different, you know, yeah. that's just the way it is. Now, they wanted Annie to do the same. They wanted her to take this pledge. They wanted her to, like, get away from it. And she said, fuck off. She did it. Okay. No, she did it. Great. But, and she, but she did it to please them and not for herself. And, and that's not going to work. This is evidenced by the evident by the fact that she didn't stop and actually ra- ramped up her rum dr- drinking up to the point that in 1877, John, her husband, requested that she enter a program to get sober. Okay. So she did agree and she en- entered a voluntary program. I didn't even realize. Okay, so they do kind of have programs. But not great programs. Not great These ones. are not programs where you're going and you're having, you're like actually talking about things and working it's through why like you're drinking and getting to the bottom of it and like actually having like support and stuff. It was like a lot of just like forced religion and forced, like it was a lot of stuff that wasn't going to help you get to the bottom of why you were drinking in the first place and yeah. maybe get you to want to stop. Yeah. Forcing anybody to do anything is never going to have great results. Yeah. Now she spent up to a year in that program. So she was really trying. And while she was in there, her sisters actually paid to have her daughters sent to school. So that's nice. So her siblings did rally around her and were like, let's, we want to make sure she that had our nieces are getting what they need. And the sisters also helped the two um, the two children get like take the important societal steps that they felt were necessary, like taking music lessons and like learning this and that, like learning how to be proper ladies, yeah, like all that were, kind of they stuff. They were nurturing the kids because that's what they thought was supposed to be happening. Very Bridgerton. Now John got another job in Windsor with another wealthy family after he was fired from the last one, and it was very rewarding. This one. He moved their daughters to live over the stables at St. Leonard's Hill Mansion, where he worked. It was very nice there. The people were nice there. While Annie's sisters helped out with making sure her daughters received the schooling and training they would need, John's boss provided the family with um, a nanny named Carolyn. Great. Unfortunately, Emily Ruth Jane was di- she was suffering from epilepsy. Oh, no. Which meant she would be treated by society like she was a demon spawn. Oh, because no. at the time, epileptics were not treated as like, oh, you have a disorder and we need to help you. You've been touched by the hand of the devil. You Something terrible was done for this to happen to you and you're possessed by a demon. What the fuck? Yeah, it was really bad. Um, and they even at, at times, like people thought epilepsy was brought on by like too much masturbation. Or, like that was a thing. Jesus Christ. Or just being possessed by a demon. I cannot. So things, they were able to, a lot of t- the nanny, I guess, was really taking care of Emily Ruth Jane. Like she was there to make sure that she was taken She knew care of. that she was not possessed by the exactly. devil. Exactly. Um, things seemed to be going well. And then Annie came home from treatment. She had completed that almost year of treatment. She was ready to live with her family again. So she moved in. They were all excited to have her back. But everyone else who was working and living on this estate was a little suspicious of her coming back. Like the the people they were working for were like, I don't know about this mm-hmm. because they're like, you know, they're elite and they're That's they're looking so at this shitty. as she's made this mistake and she can't possibly come back. But look, it. she's trying to rectify it. Like exactly. that, that sucks. And they thought she was faking her sobriety, all that stuff. Like give her a chance. Yeah. Now around this time, she became pregnant. Uh, with a son who would later be named John Alfred. Unfortunately, she was not able to stick to sobriety and things got pretty messy and pretty bad really quickly. 
she began drinking heavily again um while pregnant i'm not sure if it was while pregnant i can't say for sure but she was definitely drinking at this time and some people say there is a story that i've read in a lot of different sources that say she was really going along with the sobriety thing but then one day i think john had like a cold and back then you would have like a hot cup of whiskey to right. like loosen it, loosen it up and he did that and then he gave her a kiss goodbye to go to work and she tasted the whiskey and that's what set her oh no into it that's a story i've heard it in many different places but obviously we can't confirm that um all we know is that it did get bad so john eventually had enough he didn't want to lose another job That supported his family, so he threw her out, even though she was pregnant at the time that he threw her out. So I imagine she was drinking while pregnant. Woof. Now, her son John was born with partial paralysis and had to be placed into a hospital shortly after birth. Nothing worked for him there. Obviously, they weren't able to cure the paralysis. And even though John and Annie had come together again while this was going on because they wanted to support each other, this was tragic. Um, She went right back into drinking heavily again, got bad again. She was spending all the money on rum and neglecting to buy food and clothing and such. He told her, this is the last straw. I never want to see you again. So she left and was homeless for a while. After weeks of struggling, she knew it was Whitechapel where she was going to be able to find cheap lodging and maybe some kind of work. Yeah. It was exactly how I have explained it to be with hard conditions, a deep disdain for those living in poverty. It was just bad. Of believes that you deserve to feel your best this summer. From getting outside to enjoying your favorite seasonal dishes to taking a mental break, Care Of is here to help you take care of yourself all summer long. Care Of's convenient individual packages make it super, super easy to travel with them. You grab a couple, one for each day that you're gone, and your vitamin routine is set even when you're away from home. Now you say to me, what is Care Of? And I tell you, it's a subscription service that ships high quality, personalized vitamins, supplements, and powders conveniently right to your door every month. All you have to do to get them is take a short, in-depth quiz. It's all about your lifestyle. These are questions you know the answers to. What's your diet? How do you sleep? What's your exercise system like, you know? All your health goals, and then you get a personalized recommendation. Taking the guesswork out of what supplements are best suited for you. I know it, that you've been on that Target aisle or that Walgreens aisle, just being like, which vitamin am I supposed to get? Should I get that one? What's the difference between this one and that one? Now you don't have to do that. Just take an online quiz. You don't even have to go anywhere and then it gets shipped right to you. Each shipment comes with a customized booklet showing you exactly what's in your individual daily packets and why it was recommended specifically for you and your health goals. I took the quiz. It's super duper easy. Again, you know all the answers to the questions. It's all about you. And I got a a good amount of like supplements and vitamins. One of the best uh, vitamins that I think they added to my personal shipment was vitamin D. And I definitely am feeling like a boost in energy from that. You guys are going to love Care Of. And for 50% off your first Care Of order, go to takecareof.com and enter code MORBID50. Again, that's 50% off your first Care Of order by going to takecareof.com and entering code MORBID50. So John, of course, I mentioned it in the first part, was required to pay her a week's a weekly allowance. Oh, yeah, but I forgot about that. That's really all she had in the beginning. But then she started to, she was like, you know what? I have some talents here. Like she possessed many talents. Um, Everyone who came forward to say they were around her during this time in her life said she was sweet, intelligent, and well-spoken. They, she was also, they said she was feisty, but like in a fun way. Yeah. They felt calm around her when she wasn't drinking. Okay. When she drank... It was a whole other story. It's so sad how that happens because the dual personality. Pe- like you, it could be your best friend, yep. and you're like, "I love you so much," and then it's a whole entire yeah. different side. And like you know, that person is such a good person, and, and what that, they're capable of. Yeah, and what comes out when they drink is just not who they this person are. is. Um, but while she had previously, so while she was in in treatment for that year, uh, she had spent a lot of her time sewing and crocheting okay. and getting really good at it. Um, and so while in Whitechapel, she decided, like many other women at the time, that she could crochet, sew, and make artificial flowers and sell it all. 
People used to buy them. I said before that they would put them on these like fancy hats. Cool. Um, And she dragged her wares to what is now known as West Ham to sell them. Unfortunately, it wasn't a like booming business. No. She was getting really almost nothing for it. All her hard work and she was barely getting anything back. And that sucks. Now, her next move was to take up with men she knew who could help her pay her way. She was especially known to be around a man nicknamed the Pensioner, who was actually named Ted Stanley. He was older and had her wrapped a bit with his charms. And he had like, you know, tales of his colorful life and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. He was currently working as a bricklayer. So he did have a constant source of income, but he wasn't like rolling in it. Was he a good dude? Yeah. So around this time, she got news. Posh. Eh, not really. So around this time, it, you it's hard to find good dudes in this story. It is. There are some, though. There are some. I felt like uh, her previous husband was like, kind John of... Chapman seemed to have given... He gave it his all. He did. He really did. He seemed to have given, yeah. given it a good a good, a go. good go. Don't love that he threw her out while pregnant. Just don't love that. that. Yeah, don't love that. Yeah. That's the thing. You really got to find the good here. And it's real... It's real hard Sparse. to find. Sparse. It's like, oh, blink and you miss it. Oh, like, that's... Yeah. yeah. So... Around this time, she got news, and this is sad, this, she got news that her estranged husband, John Chapman, was very ill. Oh, no. And that he was not expected to live much longer. Oh, Jesus. Uh, she walked, this just broke my heart, she walked because it was her only option with no money. She tried to walk all the way to Windsor to be there for him. And it's like crazy far. In his last days, but she wasn't fast enough because it took so long. Oh, no. He died on Christmas Day, 1886, and apparently, and this is going to be something that's going to make you go, oh, his cause of death was cirrhosis of the liver from heavy and long-term drinking. I just don't know if you've ever heard this phrase. It's called um, the pot calling the kettle yeah. black, John. Now, I don't know what his drinking situation was. I don't know if he was drinking in the sense of, like, he must have been, like, consistently drinking. Yeah. But I don't know what how that was affecting his outside life at all. It because seems like he was a functioning you know what i mean like yeah but it's like that's not fair that uh, that's just kind of shitty but well, you it's truly really what you said pot calling the yeah. kettle black like you're both struggling from the same thing like and you're shitting on her because she's just not as good as get yeah. good at it as you are exactly it's it's a tough situation because of course it's like back then people were doing things when they were pregnant that they weren't supposed to be doing because not a lot was known about it and yeah. it's just whatever but and obviously a lot of bad choices are made here. No one's making correct choices here. I said it in part one. We're not going to find this thing no. where it's like, well, this person just has it all together. Like, right. no one had it together back no then. No one it really has wasn't. it together anyway. It just wasn't going well. So it's like, sure, we can sit here and look at it and say a lot. The, these women made a lot of bad choices. Yeah. Do any of them deserve the shit that they went through? Absolutely no fucking one not. Does. No one does. No. Like it's really shitty, and I'd never want them to be portrayed as deserving of being no of being put in the situations they were put in. Because once they made it to Whitechapel, there wasn't a lot of choices. They didn't really have a lot of, a lot of chance. And it's like choices leading up to that. Sure, could have been different yeah. in a lot of the situations, but not all of them. And just a side note question you can die of cirrhosis of the liver and actually not drink right like cirrhosis of the liver can be caused by other things yeah it definitely can't his was caused his was. by heavy drink but I, I was like did i hear that correctly? <laughs> like, like i know I? I know i've heard that yeah so she was obviously devastated by his death because although they had a rocky relationship i think that there was like love there and yeah. they just couldn't function together is really the problem um, she was devastated. She never recovered from it. And a lot of people said she lost a lot of her spark and her hope after that. Um, there was a lot of guilt associated with his death, I think. Yeah, definitely. So now she turned to sex work to try to stay afloat because that's, I mean, I told you the numbers. There was an unbelievable amount of sex workers like actively working in the city of Whitechapel. And it was either a full-time gig because they had nothing else and that's yeah. the only way they could afford lodging mm -hmm. or it was a part-time thing right. where they would do the dressmaking, dress laundrying, um, tailoring, crocheting, like anything like that. And then on the side, they would do it to supplement. Right. It was very common. I mean, what else was there to yeah. do? And at this point, you know, she, even though this was 
an extremely dangerous and violent line of work to go into. She really had no choice. Yeah. And well, now again, she doesn't have that money coming in from John. Exactly. So she, and I think she felt really hopeless. So I think it was like, yeah, she's sad. She only wanted money to keep drinking and keep a roof over her head whenever she could. Right. Really. That was it. And she was often seen entertaining clients in Spitalfields and Whitechapel. Now, at this point, she started staying on dun, 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 Dorset Street. Hey. It was in a DOS house, which we've already mentioned as being the worst and most violent street of them all. Sure have. It was dangerous, horrific for her, and the money she earned from sex work only afforded her this and her constant flow of rum. That's it. Mm-hmm. She didn't. She really didn't care about much else. Well, and, I mean, she's lost her husband. She's lost her children. She's yeah. just like existing. She's just floating through. A lot of them f- could probably felt a little bit like ghosts just floating through the yeah. motions. Um, This is when she began earning the nickname Dark Annie, because as I said, when she drank, she got a little gnarly. Mm. She was pretty violent and angry when she drank, and her circumstances met with the guilt she felt about her children and John was not helping her drunken rages from occurring less. And then I just thought of, too, her parents were alcoholics. She had a rough childhood, I'm she did. sure. I'm yeah. sure she has a lot of years of trauma. There's a lot of trauma happening here, for sure. And it's just, it's a, they're all sad stories. None of these stories are like, wow, this is a happy ending. It's yeah, like all everything very going sad. for them. And then. Yeah. So the Doss house she was staying at was 35 Dorset Street at Crossinghams, which was managed by a man, a man named Timothy Donovan. He was not a nice guy, really. Shocking. Uh, It was a house licensed to shelter 144 people, but he crammed over 300 in there. Mm, Okay. Now, Ted Stanley, the pensioner, was still kind of controlling Annie at this point, but was not actually helping her at all. That's the thing. I'm like, you want to help her out, brother? Every now and then he would pay her for her bed at the Doss house, but he actually told the man running the Doss house that if Annie brought another man in there, he had to throw her out. What the fuck? But he... And at first you'd be like, well, yeah. what? No, I know what his but deal is. But he was seeing another woman named Eliza Cooper and paying for her bed, too. I had a feeling. Couldn't bother to let them stay with him. Just let them stay in filth every once in a while on his dime. That's all he would do. Like, what the fuck, dude? Now, around this time, towards the end of August, she ran into her brother, Fountain, on Commercial Road. She hadn't, he did not know how bad things had gotten. She was scared to tell him what she was going through, was embarrassed. So she kind of made it seem not all that bad. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm okay. I'm just like scrounging a little bit. He was kind and he gave her some money that he had in his pocket. The two of them sat down for a drink and that was it. That's like just knowing what happens and what he had to go through after. That's heartbreaking. Now, Ted Stanley and Eliza Cooper became became witnesses to Annie's last days, unfortunately. Uh, Ted told investigators he had seen her at the Britannia pub on Dorset Street, September 2nd, 1888, with Eliza Cooper. Oh. Apparently, they were not friends. I didn't think so. Apparently, a couple of days before this, Annie had borrowed a piece of soap from Ted Stanley, and it was meant for Eliza. And Eliza got pissed because Annie had promised to give it back, but didn't have it when Eliza confronted her. Annie threw a half penny at her and told her, here, buy some more. (laughs) Like, just tossed it at her. Oh, man. So when they saw each other at the Britannia, they were both drunk and the familiar rage boiled up within them both. They immediately went after each other, screaming at each other. They were physically pushing each other, getting into each other's faces. And you're like, girls, the pensioner is not worth yeah. this at all. It was getting ugly. Witnesses said the fighting was continuous. It went back all the way back to the Doss house they were fighting. Oh, man. Where Annie then slapped Eliza and Eliza lost it. She beat Annie badly and left her in bad condition. Oh, no. Now, um, Annie's friend, Amelia Farmer, who would later identify her body, saw her the next day after this, and she said she was horrified by her condition. Oh, no. She had a black eye, a horribly bruised chest, and she was feeling really ill. Likely, my thoughts are from blows to the head. She was probably suffering from something. Even. She said she couldn't eat anything and had only had a cup of tea that day. So Amelia gave her some money for more tea and then said, please take care of yourself and do not drink. She was like, do not spend this money on drink. And not she said, right buy now. yourself some tea. Yeah. So she told her, so Annie said, sure, I'm going to go to Whitechapel Workhouse tonight. Like, I'll, I'll try to rest. And Amelia later said of Annie, quote, I'm afraid she used to earn her living partly on the streets. She was a straightforward woman when she was sober, clever and industrious with the needle, but she could not take too much drink. She had been living a very irregular life all the time I've known her. 
Uh, Annie did return to Whitechapel Workhouse, and in return for a cold bath and some shitty stew, she was made to pick oakum, which is a very common thing that the poor were for, forced to do in these workhouses. She had to meticulously um, untangle old ship ropes. Oh, my God. And then get them into, like, these strands that could be used. And it was murder on the hands and yeah. very intense work. It would, like, destroy your hands, just rip them apart. bleeding by the end of it. So she saw her again that Friday, September 6th, around 5 p.m., after she had left the workhouse, and she said she was still feeling terrible. She told Amelia she didn't even feel well enough to go to Stratford to try to sell anything. She said she was trying to push through and said she was going to pull herself together and earn some money. Or she said, I'm going to be sleeping outside tonight. I if wonder I if she had like, my first thought was um, like, I wonder if she had a broken rib that caused mm. internal bleeding or something. Yeah. Well, we find out. Oh, we so do. by 7 p.m., she went back to the Doss house and asked Timothy Donovan if she could just sit in the kitchen for a while. And he wouldn't let her, I He's, bet. So she was like, I don't have money. I just need to sit. He did say yes. Okay. He said, yep, you can sit in there. She was seen in the kitchen by another lodger, Frederick Stevens, around 12, 10 a.m. He referred to her as being, quote, rather worse for drink. So I think she was, like, needing drink at this time. Oh, she's going through, like, withdrawal, She might probably. have been. So a bit after this, another lodger named William said he saw her in the kitchen as well and chatted with her. He, too, said she was not doing well and that she had taken out a little uh, paper box of pills from her pocket. And it broke when she pulled it out. Mm -hmm. So the pills went everywhere and he helped her gather them. She found a scrap of envelope in the kitchen and put the pills in there and placed them back in her pocket. This is the envelope with the pills they found next to her body mere hours after this. So, and she had gotten those pills apparently from the infirmary she had gone to. So they were, I think there was only two in there. Okay. Um, She left after this and William said he thought she had gone to her bed. He was, she would normally sleep in, but instead she had left and come back around 1.35 a.m. I think she had gotten a little bit to drink at that point. She hung out in the kitchen for a bit longer. And then around 2 a.m., Timothy Donovan, the DOS manager, who had known her for months, by the way, he kicked her out because she hadn't paid for a bed at 2 a.m. Are you kidding me? It's like, just let her sleep in the kitchen even. That's the thing. She t- And she told him how sick her a bed. she was. You know her. Yeah. Yeah. She told him how sick she was, but he said he didn't give a shit and, and he do- tossed her out. I think, number one, he doesn't give a shit because he wants to make his money. But do you also think he maybe thought she was drunk and was just like, you got to get out of here? I think, yeah. he did. Well, I think all it was, I think it was black money. and white. You didn't pay for a bed. You You're don't out. get to stay here. Get out. That's so fucked up. And she told him when she left, he said, he said, she told me, keep my bed open because I'm going to make my money and I'm going to sleep in it. Okay. And he was like, all right. So at that point, the night guard, whose name was John Evans, said he saw her leave. He escorted her out of the DOS house around 1.45 a.m. So she must have wandered around for hours looking for clients to make her money for lodging. Um, At 5.30 a.m., there was a confirmed witness report from a park keeper's wife, Elizabeth Long, who said she was on her way to the market at that time, and she spotted what she knew was Annie Chapman speaking to a man next to a house on Hanbury Street. She said the man looked, quote, like a foreigner. Not sure what that means. Uh, yeah, right. And was wearing a deer stalker hat and looked to be over 40 years old. A deer stalker hat is that classic plaid type hat you, hat you see on like the Sherlock Holmesy kind of guy. Mm, it's I think got I know flaps on the ear. It's like oh, a very like okay. yep. it's a very it's very uh, stereotypical of what you would think of when you see the hat with like the Sherlock Holmes. I gotcha. Thing. Uh, so he was wearing one of those. That becomes a a recurring thing, mm. by the way. And she said that he asked her, "Will you?" And she said, "Yes." This was near the place Annie was found at 29 Hanbury Street. So this could have been Jack. Could have been Jack. So a few moments later, a man living next door to 29 Hanbury Street at number 27 said he heard panic and terror. His man, his name was Albert Kadosh, and he reported later that he heard screaming. Oh, geez. He said, quote, I live at 27 Hanbury Street and I am a carpenter. 27 is next door to 29 Hanbury Street. On Saturday, September 8th, I got up about a quarter past five in the morning and went into the yard. It was then about 20 minutes past five, I should think. As I returned towards the back door, I heard a voice say no, just as I was going through the door. It was not in our yard, but I should think it came from the yard of number 29. 
I went indoors, but returned to the yard about three or four minutes afterwards. While coming back, I heard a sort of fall against the fence, which divides my yard from that of 29. It seemed as if something touched the fence hard and suddenly. Oddly, he just ignored it and went back to his shift for work. It's like you took the time to go back there and check to listen. Yeah. You heard something weird and you said, huh, that was weird. And... He definitely heard her being murdered. I mean, like he, he, heard, he heard that. She was right course. next to the fence. That's where she was found. And she's being brutally attacked, clearly. Yeah. But I wonder if she couldn't make much noise because the windpipe. He had pipe. cut her throat. Exactly. So 6 a.m. rolls around and our friend John Davis stumbles upon the horrifically brutalized dead body of Annie Chapman. Now, when we began here, she was found in the yard of 29 Hanbury Street by John. The coroner had determined her throat had been so deeply cut, it had clearly been an attempt to remove her head completely from her body. And she had been violently and pretty theatrically disemboweled. Yeah. So after searching the area and finding the bloodstains on the fence above her, her wedding ring and a couple of other rings had been forcibly removed from her finger, uh, the pocket in her skirt cut open, all those contents placed around her. Um, uh, Then they found that leather apron that was soaked in water. So after all of this, they finally took her body to Whitechapel Workhouse Infirmary Mortuary. This was in Old Montague Street. This was a shed, essentially. Jesus. Shit was not great. No. Like, how are you doing, Dr. Phillips? Not well, bitch, is what he would say. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> that's what he would say. He was not happy with his... A lot of these coroners were like, hey, guys, help. We have a pretty important job and you're not yeah. giving us like any shit to work with. Like, can we ha- somebody help us? But so, again, not shocking. Not at all. Annie was described as being about 48 years old. She was short at about five feet. Um, she was described as stout. She had dark hair that waved a bit, blue eyes, like I said, and two of her bottom teeth were missing. Okay. Now, when a proper examination was conducted of the body, now that it was stripped and washed, the condition was even more horrific than they thought. Her face and tongue was swollen. Now, this led him to believe there was some kind of suffocation uh, before he attempted to move the head because your tongue will protrude and swell. I didn't realize that. Yeah. So her eye especially had a massive bruise on it and so did her chest. He was able to determine that the bruises on her chin and the sides of her jaw were recent and likely from the killer, but the chest and eye and temple bruising were from several days earlier. We know who. Good old Eliza. Biatch. So now since the head of the criminal investigations department, Robert Anderson, was now informed of what was happening back home. Oh, man. He was starting to get uh, lightly trashed in the press for being away and not returning to stop this. I mean, Yeah. After all, now we had Marianne Nichols and Annie Chapman murdered in similar and very brutal ways in his in his jurisdiction. And there were arguments if there were two others. Exactly. At this point, the CID, which is tasked with investigating and stopping this spree, is effectively leaderless, leaderless at this point. Yeah. So when the inquest began two days later, even more horrific details were released. Now, they didn't release any of these into the papers. None of the papers had any kind of knowledge of these. But initially, Dr. Phillips didn't even want to release them to the anything. He didn't want to talk about them. He didn't want them on the record. Hmm. He had a good reason for this, and I understand what he was saying. He said the injuries and mutilations were so horrific that it would be, quote, too painful to the feelings of the jury in public. He said, I released the cause of death, which was a severed carotid artery. He said everything after that was gratuitous and does not have anything to do with the cause of death. All you need to know is the cause of death. You do not need to know what co- anything after that. Oh. He was saying, like, we can have it on record, whatever, but I don't want it released to the public. Okay. I do understand Smart. where he was coming from with that, trying to save gratuitous details from being released that didn't cause the co- her death. Yeah. But, like, obviously you can't do that because a lot of this has to do with the pathology of the killer. So... But yeah. at that time, that was not Well, and they're really. probably worried about public terror at this point. That's the thing. So at first, the inquest bros agreed. But then they said... The inquest yeah, bros. Yeah, at first they were I like... I could not let that go. They were, gonna, they were like, okay, yeah, that we get that. But then they were like, nah, you need to come back and you need to tell us every single detail. I, like, I, he's like, I just need him. I need them all. They mm-hmm. were like, we got to release these. We got, we're not going to release them in the press, but we need to at least have them so that we can investigate files. from them. 
Uh, but before he agreed to tell them, he said, okay, fine, I will. I guess I have to. But he said, I want every woman and any children that could be in the area to leave. I don't want them to be subject to any of this. He said this is not fit for publication in any media source. And it's not fit for women. It is not. So as Fuck he explained you. the following, and well, back then it wasn't even like, it's not fit for women. They were like, your constitutions are too delicate to hear such yeah. terrible things. Like that was their way of like, I'm trying to save the women and the children from hearing this horrific nightmare. Yeah, yeah. I get the children. Um, as he explained the following, several men in the room actually fainted. So there's that. So foo-foo so on go. you. Uh, so this is what it said. It said her neck was cut twice, one after the other from left to right. And they were so deep that they cut into the vertebrae with a clear attempt to remove the head from the body. This is where it gets even wilder. Quote, the abdomen had been entirely laid open and the intestines severed from their mesenteric attachments, which had been lifted out and placed on the soldier shoulder of the corpse whilst from the pelvis, the uterus and its appendages with the upper portion of the vagina and the posterior two thirds of the bladder had been entirely removed. Obviously, the work was that of an expert or on at least who had such knowledge of anatomical or pathological examinations as to be enabled to secure the pelvis organs with one sweep of the knife. You can, like, feel that. So he said those organs were removed from her body. In one sweep. Without jagged cuts, without a bunch of just tearing through shit. And I can tell you. You can. I can speak from some experience here that it is hard they would tell you, okay, start the start the cuts, and you would have to take a second to find that part of the colon that you want to start at. It was hard, and you would look in there with the spotlights of a of you know two thousands and whatever's lab lights on here. All the technology that we have, all yeah. the lighting sources, everything that we have, that is hard. Yeah, it all looks the same when you open it up. It's all beige. It's imagine. all red. It's all gooped together. It's everything. You you don't just look in there and be like, well, that is the pelvis. That is it's that no. is the bladder. That's the uterus. These are the fallopian tubes. It's like, just a whole bunch of stuff. You find it, but it takes some time and it takes some skill and, and it knowledge. takes some observation and it takes a lot of digging around and really finding where you're going to cut or else you're going to be making a fucking mess of someone's insides and no one wants to do that. And years of studying before you even get to the point where they hand you the knife to cut someone. Exactly. We still had books in the in the autopsy suite, anatomy and pathology books so that we could reference them if we needed Absolutely. to. It happens. But we're talking about 1888 in Whitechapel, like where, dark. like I said, darkness is something you have not experienced until you were in 1888 Whitechapel. And he's not like pulling darkness. out his iPhone for the flash. He's not pulling out any kind of light source. No. If he does have a light source, it's, it's a lantern. It's a lantern, which I don't think he had because no one said they saw anybody with a lantern. He's doing this in the fucking dark. He's doing this with no time at all to spare in haste waiting for people to show up. I have all the time in the fucking world in the autopsy suite, and it takes me a long fucking time. And right. to remove the pelvic block? That's hard. What, that's is the pe what is the pelvic block? That's the what they're talking about with, like, the bladder, the pelvis, like, the whole block of organs that are in your... Oh, okay. Um, like, even, like, the, you know, the thoracic block. Like, you're, they're all blocks of organs that usually you, for an autopsy, will take out all together. You'll keep them all connected, and oh. you will lift them out of the body together. And he took them out separately. But in order to do that, you have to cut connections that you know exist. Otherwise, you're just going to be slicing through most of these organs and fucking up the whole abdomen. How's that donut on your way to work, though? <laughs> so this guy, if he was able to take what they're saying to me, is what they told what they, me what the, what dr phillips tells me here is that he took the uterus its appendages and the upper portion of the vagina and posterior two-thirds of the bladder yeah, he you took like all of that to say that again he took all of that that's hard work to do and that's somebody that in my opinion has at least a working knowledge of anatomy i like have cramps all of a sudden but it's not even that yeah area of it's life it's just that it, it, I don't understand 
and maybe I'm standing on an island alone here. I know a lot of people will be like, pish posh with the anatomy knowledge thing. No. No, because no. I, uh, you have to learn like very, very, very basic anatomy for in hair school, actually. Yeah. It was even like basic, basic, basic anatomy. I could not wrap my brain around. Like that's intense. And it's just, I think unless you have taken part in a dissection and an evisceration and an autopsy, it's hard to understand the nuances and the small, tiny things that are involved in that. Yeah. That you don't just rip organs out of somebody's body. You don't just like go, oh, I see a uterus rip. Like, right. that's not how that works. No. There are so many little connections that you have to make sure you cut before you take it out. Yeah, I can appreciate that. And I mean, it, like, I can't, ima- I can't imagine if I, if you, if the, even if the body was opened up for mm-hmm. me and somebody told me, like, where's the uterus? I'd be like, I have no fucking no, idea. No, it's hard to Like, I can point out. to the general area on me where it is. Is, yeah. But like in a body, no fucking way. Exactly. And what's crazy is so that Dr. Phillips believed that this person, like I do, definitely had knowledge of the human body and anatomy. Had to have. It was one of those things that he believed couldn't have just been, like I said, somebody ripping organs out willy nilly. No way. I mean, they took the they took part of the vagina, the upper portion of the vagina and part of the bladder. Right. And they took the appendages from the uterus. They took the whole damn thing. What does that mean? Like the fallopian tubes. They okay. took the, you know, they took all of the stuff that goes along with your uterus, basically okay. the reproductive system. Yeah, it was like, like a, a like a crude hysterectomy. Exactly. That's exactly a perfect way to say it. Thank you. Now, especially also when you add on to this that it was completed within the time frame of about 15 fucking minutes. Do you know how long a hysterectomy takes when you're... Oh, a hysterectomy uh, takes hours. Oh, so this is insane. Yeah, and, it, and what's crazy, like I've done what's called rapid autopsies. Those are the middle of the night fairs, the ones that are 2 a.m. Hey, come in and do this really quick. Mm -hmm. And a rapid autopsy, you're going in there, you have to, you're, you're kind of doing it in a less organized fashion. You need to get tissue out quickly within two hours of death. Okay. Even with that. It's intense. You are taking a moment to figure out and like kind of like orient yourself in the body, even just to take pieces of tissue from certain organs. In that 15 minutes... I, I, it would be a real challenge. Yeah. Maybe if you set up a time clock for me and I, maybe I could do it, but I would have a lot of trouble. And getting all that out. Luckily you would not have to like, no, that's wild. But getting all that out in that amount of time, it would, it would be a challenge. So (laughs) I don't think this is just like a leather worker. No, I don't think so at all. Rough estimate. Like how long do you think it took him to do that? For him to, like, kill her, do all of that, and then be out. They're thinking it was 15 minutes. 15 minutes. They're thinking it was, it could be 15 minutes or less that he was doing these things in. One of them, I mean, we'll talk about Mary Jane Kelly, who's the last victim. He got to take his time with that one because... They were private. He was inside of somewhere, and he really went for it. But the other ones, it was like, he was going quick because he had to get the hell out of there. Most of the time, they would find them, and they were warm. Wow. Like, he was, he had just left... It's wild. Now, all of that said, what's even sadder, what they found out, was that the cause of death was loss of blood from a severed um, carotid artery. Um, She was actually actively dying before Jack the Ripper got to her. She was suffering from a disease that the doctor said was slowly killing her. Oh. It affected her brain and possibly her lungs. And the idea is that it was probably either syphilis or tuberculosis that she was suffering from. Okay. Okay. So she was in bad shape before. Now, the murder weapon was determined to be a knife that was likely long at around six to uh, six to eight inches and very sharp. Yikes. They thought the same thing for Mary Nichols. Yep. He pointed out that a slaughterhouse worker's knife would be possible for these injuries, but not a leather worker. Okay. So he was like, that's not saying they wouldn't have a knife like that. They just wouldn't use it for their trade. It's even crazy to me to think that he could have been a slaughterhouse worker, though, because that anatomy is still different. It's different, but I guess maybe Similar. you have a little more... You have a leg up on somebody that has no exactly, knowledge. Of but like an inside of a body, but still. it's a different kind of body. Um, but again, these these are very important uh, things to point out because with these being such big trades in the area and everywhere, it was necessary to narrow the scope a little and be like, I don't think it's a leather worker. I think it's more of these people. So again, the coroner at the time said he was not even provided a map of the area. He wasn't provided anything that could he could refer to again to see where the body was positioned. They ignored his request for it. 
So he was just like, cool, I guess I'll go fuck myself then. Thanks, That's guys. so irritating. Again, how you doing, Dr. Phillips? Not well, bitch. Uh-uh. Because nobody's giving me anything to work with. He's trying to make it nice. I'm really on the side of coroners, and I understand that, but, like, that must be really fucking annoying. You're like, you need me. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> but, they need him, and they're not giving him any resources. You need me, and you're not helping me out here. Now, meanwhile, 29 Hanbury Street, where she was found, turned into kind of a tourist attraction because the people who lived there decided this was a business venture now, and they started charging people to come through the place where Annie was murdered and found. The past was fucked up. Yeah. The past was fucked up. And as was common back then, neighbors were charging people to look out their windows that looked over the yard as well. The past was fucked up. A little bit. So the inquest had brought up a lot of distaste for the way the case was being handled by witnesses and by the press. Gee whiz, I wonder why. A witness said during the inquest that when he came upon a police constable when he found Chapman's body, so one of those men that he had grabbed, John Davis had grabbed, the police constable initially told him uh, he couldn't come. He had to go find someone else. So he was like, we might have found a dead body. And he was like, I can't move. I don't know what to tell you. This fucking police constable said, well, I have orders not to leave my post no matter what. Apparently, some police constables were not beat walkers, but they just were sitting at a fixed post. That was their job. Okay. They couldn't move. But no one was happy with this fucking excuse. They were like, dude, there's a dead body. I know you have orders, but like maybe you can leave your post for that. That's a rock and a hard place. It is a very rock and a very hard place. I will. I will fully admit that. Yeah. But they were like not happy with it. Yeah. I get, And I, it's hard because on the outside, you don't understand like. Yeah. Like what could happen if he leaves his post? You exactly. Know? Like, is he leaving his post? Now that is leaving a post without a police th- there. And maybe that was Jack's intention all along was to exactly. get a police away from an area so he could cause more damage. Because I was going to say the other thing is if he left his post and then like he like he might have gotten in trouble for that because Jack could have been walking by after exactly. killing her. So yeah. I get it. There's a lot. Of, there's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Rules. But that along with the like not giving the corner anything, they were like, can you? Yeah. You got to get mad at what you can get mad at and try to understand what you can. Exactly. Now, Annie's brother Fountain paid for her funeral. Yeah, um, but she was buried in a public grave in Manor Park Cemetery in Forest Gate, which meant people would be buried on top of her eventually. And her family was not allowed to put a headstone where she was. So What the yeah. actual fuck? Yeah, they didn't treat uh, death people in poverty very well. So in 2008, the cemetery where she is buried, I mean, I was going to say they didn't, but like, or any any anywhere now don't treat people in poverty very well no. still so in 2008 the cemetery where she was bur- where she is buried put a plaque where she's buried like around the area they don't know for sure exactly like the perfect spot That's so sad but it says this plaque is dedicated to the memory of Annie Chapman died 8th September 1888 a victim of the infamous Jack the Ripper her remains are buried within this area so at least you know the area yeah now, Sir Charles Warren tried to calm the increasing panic that was starting to seep into Whitechapel, Spitalfields, and beyond with these horrific mutilation murders. Right. And in doing so, he came off looking like an asshole at times, for sure. Uh, like September 15th, after two murders so heinous they couldn't even be printed in full detail in the press, he dictated a memo to the Home Office in order to transfer the responsibility of the case into Donald Swanson's hand. Okay. Um, this, he was like another detective because with Robert Anderson out, he was like, we have to give this to someone while he's not here until he gets here. So Donald Swanson was who got it. The memo he wrote said, quote, I am convinced that the Whitechapel murder case is one which can be successfully grappled with if it is systematically taken in hand. That's fine, sure. Yeah. I go so far as to say I could myself in a few days unravel the mystery if I could spare the time and give individual attention to it. Fuck off. Woof, my dude. Also, like, no, you couldn't. You didn't. You you haven't. You didn't. Right. You, you had many days. You did not do it. I could do it. I just didn't. You said it could be solved easily if someone gave a shit and had the time. That's literally what you just said. If someone gave a shit and gave the time to it, they could do it. But I don't. That's the cliff He notes. said, I would just solve it in a few minutes, you know, but I don't have the time. So I guess you all have to suffer some more. Bye. Also, like, just like this isn't a Sudoku puzzle. This is these are people. Yeah. These are human beings. You should have stopped at the first part where you said it can if systematically taken in hand, it can be solved. That's just hopeful. We love hope. 
if you can solve it in a few days, take a few days and solve it, fucker. Right. We'll give you time off. It's a pretty dire situation. If I was on that, I would have been like, okay, Charles, take a few days off. We'll all take over for you. Yeah. It's cool. What's, you said, your, what's your duties? Days. I got it. A few days. You need me cover? Got it. See you back on Friday with Who's Jack the Ripper is. That would be great. Thanks. F- like, why would you not? Like, come on. If we're going to prevent women being found in the streets with their bowels wrapped around their shoulder, yeah. that's not important to you? No. What? So there was a little more to that memo, which makes it like a little better, I guess. But I don't know. That first part did not need to be put in there and it made him look like a jackass. Yeah, I think he might have just been a jackass. So the next thing he wrote in the memo was because he was trying to get it all organized now that Robert Anderson wasn't there. He said, I feel, therefore, the utmost importance be attached to putting the whole central office work, in this case, in the hands of one man who will have nothing else to concern himself with. So he's saying, I think it's important we give it to somebody and tell them this is all you're working on. Okay. Which that makes sense. Why the fuck did you say the other? You don't need to... It was because he was inserting his own fucking self-importance and ego Ego. into it by saying, if I had it, I could do it, but I don't have the time. Shut the fuck up. All you had to do was write that next part. And I would have been like, hell yeah, Charles Warren. But you had to insert that little fucking toxic shit into it. And I don't appreciate it. I just spit, by the way. Spittlefields. Spittlefields everywhere. So it says, neither you or I or Mr. Williamson can do this. I therefore, you just said you could, but okay. (laughs) That's the thing. I therefore put it in the hands of Chief Inspector Swanson, who must be acquainted with every detail. I look upon him for the time being as the eyes and ears of the commissioner in this particular case. He must have a room to himself, and every paper, every document, every report, every telegram must pass through his hands. He must be consulted on every subject. I would not send any directions anywhere on the subject of the murder without consulting him. I give him the whole responsibility. All the papers in central office on the suspect sub- subject of the murder must be kept in his room and plans of the positions, etc. I must have this matter at once put on a proper footing so as to be a guide for the future in cases of importance. So he's saying, here's what we need to do. Put Swanson on the case. He's in charge of the of the CID right now. Yeah. He has to be acquainted with every piece of this case. He's the one working solely on it. And we're going to look at this as a blueprint for future cases. This is how we should do it. Okay. Cool. They don't do that, though. You know, so with, (laughs) you know, so at this point, like I said, Anderson is still in Switzerland. He has not come home yet. Sir Charles Warren had to put the investigation into Donald Swanson's hands. Now, locally, he put Inspector Frederick George Aberlein in charge of the air. So he was locally in charge. Um, So, again, overall, Swanson, local shit being taken care of on a more micro level by Aberlein. Mm. A lot of people think Aberlein was in charge of the entire thing. He's often touted as being in charge of the entire thing. That's not true. He did, however, do a ton of work for it and is synonymous with that for good reason. He really did do a lot. Okay. He did kind of take over in a way. He tried really hard from the outset to catch this guy. So September 10th, only a couple of days later, a guy named John Pizer was finally found after he had gone on the run after being named a person of interest. You might remember a man named Leather Apron that I I mentioned in part one. That is him. Finally got him. Timothy Donovan, who managed the lodging house that Annie Chapman stayed at, told police... He and another witness had actually thrown Pizer out of the lodging house on several occasions because he had attacked and threatened women. Mm. And that they had saw him wearing a deer stalker hat several times, which is what witnesses like Mrs. Long saw the man last seen with Annie Chapman was wearing as well. But you said this guy's a leather worker. He's a leather worker. Now, Pizer, when they checked his home, he had up to five long bladed knives in his possession in his home on Mulberry Street clean or dirty no nobody says Flame. i imagine not dirty with blood because they probably would have mentioned that yeah yeah he was a boot finisher so that wasn't completely ridiculous that he would have several knives but it's still something he was brought in and everyone went wild over it they thought leather apron was the guy wow because the media had really put it up there and they're desperate in fact right after he was arrested according to ripper code the book that i will also um i will also uh link. what is it called link in the show notes <laughs> uh it, they were distributing a broad street out in the uh, 
a broad sheet out in the streets is what I meant. That said, quote, they've captured Leather Apron now. If guilty, you'll agree. He'll have to meet a murderer's doom and hang up on a tree. Cute, right? Um, yeah, no. Uh, oh. It's a lot. Oh. So newspapers branded him the killer. It was bad. Not they were fair. literally like, here he is. That's him, guys. There's no evidence, but he's going to be charged and sentenced in the press. It's like, yeah, he's a shithead. Right. But he, there's literally no evidence to say he's the killer at all. This is not except okay. Except he has a hat that several other people also have. Now, <laughs> when you put it that way. Yeah. A lot of, a lot was made of the fact that he also made hats on the side and that Polly Nichols had been walking around talking about and showing off her new, new black bonnet. velvet bonnet. Right. That okay. is a thing. But that's real fucking circumstantial. <laughs> well, did, she didn't get it. Did she get it that day? She was seen with it in the last, like, day or so. A couple of days, yeah. yeah. So she, it was new. It was something that they were, you know. All right. I get it. Because I, I think she said to somebody, like, um, like, do you see my jolly bonnet? Yeah. Like, it's brand new. Like, And it was new. Okay. So that was one of the last things. Interesting. Now, around the same time, Aberlene brought in a man named William Piggott to be questioned. He had blood on his clothing, and he was seen sink, um, sitting drinking a beer at a pub in Gravesend when the police were called, because they were like, this guy's just sitting drinking a beer, and he's literally covered in blood. Like, his clothes had blood all over them. It's real weird. He was also behaving very strangely and acting very nervous and anxious. Aberlene arrested him and was shocked when he saw him, because he said he was struck by, obviously, the blood on his clothes, but also by the fact that he had a very close resemblance to a man who witnesses said they heard ranting and raving about hating women in a public house in Whitechapel very shortly after Annie Chapman's murder. Oh. When they got him to the station, he said he had been in Whitechapel, and he said he was on Brick Lane when he saw a woman having a fit, and she fell to the ground. He was obviously a hero, and he tried to pick her up, but she bit him, he said, on, on the hand. So his response was to slap her in the face and drop her on the ground. Oh, no. And then he said he left because he saw police coming their way. Okay. No one confirmed this. There's no... We don't know who that woman was. If she bit him on the hand, it could have been Annie. It could have been. She was feisty. Now, he could've had a ton anybody. of injuries on his hands, and he was covered in blood, including some which had clearly been attempted to be wiped from his boots. Mm. He never explained this, mm. and they never got an explanation for it. Who, they didn't ask him, they hey, did. whose blood is this? No, they did. He just never, he wouldn't answer. Oh. And witnesses said he wasn't the guy. Witnesses saw him. He was never picked out of several lineups. Everybody, they were, and when they were brought to him, it was dark. Witnesses were like, that's not him. That's okay. not him at all. Like, they were very, like, black and white. That's not him. And the leather worker thing, you know? But he was held a bit to see if they could get someone else to ID him because they were like, this is weird. Or get him to crack even. But during that time, he got so erratic and he was slurring his words and, like, was actually freaking out. So they sent for a doctor and he was actually sent to an asylum shortly after because he was declared legally insane. From disemboweling a woman? Well, obviously, he didn't do any of the other murders because he was in exactly. in an asylum when all the other ones happened. But why was he covered in blood? We never know. And why did he we just never go insane? Find out. We never find out. That's, That's That guy's William Piggott's just like, bye. See you later. Huh. Question. I don't know if this is a dumb question. Leather workers, obviously, we unfortunately get leather from animals. Did they have to, like, get the skin from the animals themselves or was it provided to them i actually don't know that because then i guess you could have you're not like you know i imagine leather workers probably it's a symbiotic relationship probably with um, the slaughterhouses. Like slaughterhouses and other you know uh that kind of line of work uh-huh maybe but i do not know for yeah, sure i don't know i'll find out for part three cool thank you um but We'll leave it on Pizer, John Pizer, leather apron there. He was let go pretty quickly because there was literally no evidence. And his alibi was confirmed that he had been with family during Annie Chapman's murder. He had an alibi also saying that he was staying at the Crossman's Common Lodging House on the night of Nichols' murder. Oh. There was a fire by the docks that evening and he saw it and he had spoken to several people that night while it was happening. Um, so he was completely cleared of everything, but he was pissed about his name being smeared in the press he took action and actually sued a bunch of papers for libel because once you're cleared you can sue for libel yeah. if they said you were the guy he was asked a lot about why he actually went on the run because they were like well why'd you go on the run when you were named a person of interest why wouldn't you just come in and say i didn't do it and yeah. give your alibi and he said quote i will tell you the reason why i should have been torn to pieces 
And that's all he would say about it. He was like, I, I would have been torn to pieces if I came out in the daylight oh. after they had named me. And he was like, it's because you guys named me. Yeah. And if I had come out, people would have just, I like, wouldn't have even it would have been a, a mob of people like taking justice into their own hands. Yeah, that's true. So he was never charged. He was just arrested, taken in and let go immediately. And they are back to square one. And very shortly after this, there is going to be what is known as the double event. The double event. The double event. Uh, and Robert Anderson is still not going to be home for it. Honey, so. you gotta come home. Switzerland is nice, but it's time to wrap it up. Yeah, like, yeah. What we'll see is he eventually, he travels to Paris to be closer to the stuff, and then yet he does eventually come home I'm after like, the double I'm like, get out of Paris, buddy. You gotta yeah. come down to London. Yeah. Like, Just come home. Doctor's orders, schmockter's orders. You gotta come back. No, your mental health is important, so. It is, but like, this is pretty big. It is, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's your job. Big. You, you got to, like, shit or yeah. get off the pot. Leave for your mental health, I get that, or yeah, totally. just stay and ruin it. Yeah, it's like when this is <laughs> happening, like, a lot of people are counting on the police to, like, get it together here. Yeah. But, yeah, that is the story of Annie Chapman. That that one, I mean, they're all horrifically sad, but that one, just, like, from it's start tough. to finish. like, yeah. And I feel like a lot of times in these stories, too, you get these little little glimmers of hope where they kind of start to get it together. Oh, yeah. Like, even Polly went back and stayed with her husband for a little bit, and mm-hmm. things were okay. Yeah. And then it just went to shit again. Yeah, it's a lot of ebbs, like you said, ebbs and flows of sad, happy, cycle. sad, happy, sad. Not even happy, really just like content, All sad, right. content, sad. And it's like there really never gets to happiness anywhere. No, I don't know if there really was happiness if you like, actually, I do know Pretty there bleak. was no happiness if you were poor. Yeah, there was really. Which is really fucked up. Society is the worst. Yeah. It's pretty rough. I but working so uh, hard. Next one, you were going to talk about the double event. We're going to get into that. We'll get into more of the police shenanigans. Um, maybe we'll talk about ghosts some more because why the hell not? And because <laughs> if you have ghosts, then you have everything. Exactly. And if, um, we, and we, and we hope that you keep listening. Yeah, please do. There's a lot more to come with this and we hope you keep it weird. weird. But not so weird that you forget to say at the end of your show again, like I just did, because wow, that's really happening a lot lately. And I'm concerned for my brain's uh, health. <laughs> Bye. Bye.